Thank you very much, yeah, and it's good to see you. Uh, yeah, good morning to everybody. Um, I guess you could blame Brexit for me being a tra uh, transfer over to the Netherlands, but anyway, um, whatever. Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be presenting here at Desires. My apologies that I can't be there in person. There were some difficulties with me getting down, but nevertheless, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to the organizers. Um, and uh, also, I'd just like to say thank you to um, my reviewers as well. Um, Claudia and I were really, really impressed with the feedback that we got and uh, especially reviewer too, you actually helped really shape the paper and make it a lot better. So whoever you were, I have a good idea of who you are, but whoever you were, thank you very much. So uh, as Yap said, um, I'm here today to talk to you about um, something I've been working on with my PI Claudia for the best part of a year now. Um, it's called Log UI, um, web-based interaction logging infrastructure, right? So it is essentially software that captures users' interactions um, that take place in some sort of contemporary web browser or framework like an Electron app. Um, you know, uh, Slack is an example of an Electron app. Uh, and how it works is that it scans the DOM or the document object model. That's like the, the tree-like data structure that represents a web page uh, internally within the browser or the framework. Um, and what LogUI does is you instruct it to append listeners um, to elements of a web page. Uh, for example, this little, this one here is like a mouse over listener on a particular div element. Uh, it appends a listener for you on your behalf. And when that listener is fired, i.e. when the user hovers over that element, um, Log UI intercepts that, and then it appends a lot of useful information and data to it, and then stores it for you. So you can do your postdoc analysis later on, and you end up with a nice, clean interaction log. The beautiful thing about Log UI is that it abstracts away um, many of the complexities that capturing user interactions um, actually entails. Although this kind of looks relatively straightforward in principle, and you can literally do that in one line of code, there's lots of little nuances and difficulties and things that are there to try and catch you out about uh, how, different, how different browsers interpret certain things and so on and so forth which can end up you which can end up with you being confused and you can end up with really strange interaction log data and I have fallen down that trap many times before. Um, so it removes the need for developers, uh, people who develop experimental infrastructure, experimental search systems or whatever. It removes the need for you to have to do that. You simply drop this uh, log UI library in, and then it captures interactions on your behalf. It's very neat. So the reason that I um, I wanted to do this. I've been wanting to do this for some time, and I'm really grateful to Claudia for giving me the chance as, as her postdoc to actually go ahead and work on this. So thank you to Claudia uh, for that. It's because as I was going through my PhD, um, I became acutely aware of things that I'd been doing wrong when it came to capturing interactions. Um, of course, when you're running an interactive IR study, capturing interactions is the crux of the whole thing, right? If you don't have the behavioral data, then you don't really have a paper to write. Um, and there have been plenty of times when I made little mistakes and I've been fortunate enough during my PhD, thanks to Leif and his connections around the world to go visit other research labs and to uh, work with other PhD students. And I've seen similar mistakes being made. So this idea in the back of my mind was to say, can we actually uh, fix this? Can we actually make something that Oh, you know, um, solves all of these problems and makes things easier for us as researchers to um, go ahead and use. And this is actually from a paper that I wrote with Leif and Yashar. Um, Yashar is actually presenting a paper here at Desires, I believe, uh, later on. But uh, this is one of the footnotes that I had when my methodology, when I was talking about how I was capturing behavioral data and stuff. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to capture was mouse hovers in and out of um, like result summaries on a, on a results page. And as I'll show you in a minute, this was becoming, the, the data was really strange. Things were coming in in a weird order and postdoc analysis scripts were not coping with it and crashing and causing all sorts of problems. So instead of actually using the real data, we had to make approximations and that was acceptable to the reviewers and everyone understood why, but this has been an issue in the back of my mind for some time. So I'm really, really happy that I'm able to sort of take this forward now. Um, and if I was to give you an example of things that can go wrong when you're capturing interactions, 
Um, if you imagine your client web page with like three little uh, boxes on, okay? And what you want to do is you want to send the interactions to take place on that page over a network, whether it be the internet or a local area network or whatever, to some server, which then stores all of the data that's been captured to give you a resultant log. Um, if a user, let's just run the little animation, if the user hovers over and out, over and out, over and out, uh, it fires six unique events, right? One where you enter the box, one where you leave the box, repeated for the three boxes. Now, what a lot of previous implementations do is that whenever, uh, for, for logging infrastructure, and indeed for my own previous solutions, um, what they always do is they create a, a new a, a connection to the server every time an event takes place, um, an XHR request or an AJAX request, an asynchronous um, connection. And what happens when you do that is if you're creating all of these connections, which is an expensive thing to do in the first place, um, if you're doing this in rapid succession, you end up with data arriving at the server side in a different order from which it left the client. And that causes all sorts of problems. Now, of course, you can develop um, logic and tools and stuff to actually make sure that things are stored in the correct order, but that can be a headache in itself. And what I found sometimes when I was running my experiments is just like, oh, I have data and it seems to be a bit of a mess. It seems to be in a really, really strange order. So it's one of the sort of motivations for wanting to sort of do this is to actually use contemporary technologies like WebSockets, for example, to try and fix this problem once and for all, and to try and give something to the community that has been so kind to me over the years. But of course, LogUI is one of many uh, prior solutions that tried to sort of solve the, or not solve, I don't know, address the interaction, uh, user interaction problem. Um, and I invite you to have a look at the um, associated paper that we've written for this uh, presentation. Um, have a look at section two if you can and you're interested in this because we've managed to put together a really nice little story about um, what's happened over the years. And if you'd let me indulge you for just a moment, uh, because it's quite interesting. This stuff has basically been going on for as long as I've been alive. And um, early solutions would assume that you would be capturing interactions manually. You would stand behind someone at a computer with your clipboard and you would write down the things that they were doing on the computer. Obviously that's a horrible thing to do, but as computers became more powerful and had more, more backing storage, we could start to do things automatically and track these interactions. We had platform specific implementations at first, here's a couple. Um, these worked on a specific application or a specific operating system. But as time went on and the internet and the World Wide Web became a thing, uh, we started to see uh, a series of uh, papers in the literature which proposed all sorts of web-based interaction logging solutions. Um, early solutions, for example, would use a proxy server to inject code. Uh, the first example, I believe, was in 2001, uh, WebQuilt. This was a really in sort of seminal paper. Um, but as technology again evolved and developed, we started to see web 2.0 technologies where we have the, the asynchronous callbacks and stuff. And we started to see an explosion of different um, uh, solutions. Uh, Mlogger ALF, for example, is one of them as well. And interestingly, this year alone, we've had three or four um, uh, Papers proposing their own interaction logging solutions, mine being one of them. At SIGIR, there were three demo papers looking specifically at interaction logging. Big Brother, Yesel, and, and, um, and another one by uh, Han Yu Li in, in, uh, in China. So there's a lot of interest in this area. Um, the disadvantage is a lot of these older solutions, although they're really good and stuff, they're not maintained anymore. They use data technology. There are obviously commercial solutions out there as well. You could potentially use Google Analytics for that, but it's more geared towards uh, the coarse grained looking at someone navigating through various pages of a website rather than the specific interactions um, that they undertake on a, on a specific page. Although you can do that, but it's a bit convoluted to do. So yeah, LogUI fits into this. Um, it is a brand new contemporary complete solution from client to server that captures all sorts of interaction events on client 
and then the client sends them over to the server and stores them for your convenience later on. We use the principle of less is more, um, whereby, this is from experience as well, if you provide the ability to sit down and think about the web page that you're going to capture interactions on, you can think very carefully about which components of the page you want to capture these interactions for and what type of interaction, whether it be a click or a mouse press or, or, or a keyboard press, sorry. Um, and you end up with nice, clean, tidy interaction data. Other solutions like Big Brother, for example, by uh, Guido and Harry down in um, Queensland, um, capture everything. Um, so there's an argument there to say which solution is better. I would argue that less is more is the more sensible approach. Um, and certainly from the experience that I've had so far with using LogUI, the other researchers that have used it would probably agree with that. Um, another novel feature about this tool is that it's able to actually listen to the DOM or the document object model, as I said before, for changes. Modern web applications um, typically would load a single page and when you click things, JavaScript would redraw the page for you without reloading the page. Um, that presents a problem because there's no sort of clear natural break in um, uh, switching between different pages because it's all technically on the same page. So what LogUI is able to do, it's able to listen for new elements that appear in the page that are added in by JavaScript um, and automatically appends the appropriate listener to those elements if um, they match specific rules that you give it, which is neat. And I don't know of any other solution that does that yet, um, but I might be wrong and please tell me if I am wrong, but I haven't seen anything that suggests that's been done anywhere else. We also have a look at the, uh, the, the concept of uh, decoupling. So when you take away logging in structure from your main experimental apparatus, you lose something. You lose the ability to capture the data that's flying around internally within your system, right? Um, when you're trying to make something generic that works with any kind of system or platform, you need to be able to say, hey, can I have this and then take it out? And we've provided a series of different features to try and get around these sort of potential headaches, which have worked to some extent, uh, but there's more things that I think we can do in the future to try and uh, address this uh, issue further. So as this is a, a technical talk, let me just give you an overview of the architecture. Um, you could imagine, for example, your own application server sitting there running your search system or whatever, which then renders a page in the browser for the client. And imagine there's a blue box there in your page. And you want to capture when a click takes place on that page, on that, on that box. So that would fire an event. And you would uh, drop in LogUI into your uh, application's uh, template just by putting it in as a script tag. And what you also do is you specify a little configuration object, which basically provides the rules and what you should be capturing and when. So you could say, oh, I want you to log this when box is clicked. So then that gets passed into the client. So then that can detect the event that takes place. Boom. That gets sent to the blog UI server, which is a completely separate process from the application server. This can be residing on another server anywhere else in the world. We communicate exclusively through WebSockets, um, which is probably the preferred solution nowadays. That also allows you to have um, cross-origin um, cross support as well. So you don't have to worry about you know, running the server in a different location. So data can be sent down a WebSocket pipe stored in some data store. At present, it's just a MongoDB database, but we're looking at ways we could potentially develop that further um, for scalability purposes and indeed for analytics purposes as well, which I'll talk about shortly. And we also provide an additional web worker, which is available only to the researchers who use LogUI. This provides a complete control application written in React it's the first time I've ever used React, and I had a lot of fun putting this together. And I don't know if you can see it very well, because the screenshot is a little bit small here, but it lists all of the different sessions that are in place for a particular experiment and setup. And I don't know if you can see the icons, but it tells you which platform people are using, which browser people were using, and so on and so forth. Um, and it allows you to control the server, stop, start, add experiments, blah, blah, blah. It also allows you to download the interaction logs for you to put into your analysis pipeline. 
Um, at present, it's only a download feature, but as I will say later, I'm hoping we can uh, develop that further. So that's the sort of the broad architecture of how it works, um, which is quite neat, I would say. Uh, and output you would get is like in a sort of JSON format where you would potentially get like, you know, event details. So you would say like on a form submission, you can name individual events that are fired. You can specify that in your configuration. So you can identify which events have been fired at what times. Um, so when you're writing your parsing scripts, you can then quick, easily pull them out and work out the difference in time between them or whatever. Um, and we also provide uh, what we call application specific data and metadata which are two things that we've included to try and mitigate the effects of decoupling logging from the actual apparatus. So you can add in whatever values you want. So an application specific data would be unique to a particular session, for example, like a specific user ID or a group or whatever you want. This information can be stored within the logs as well, if you choose to do so. Metadata is more unique to the actual events that takes place. So for example, we submit a form the query value is the query of wildlife extinction. So you can actually pull data out from the page, whether it be the value of a field or the, the, the text value of a, of, a, of a div element or something, you can do that. You also have the ability to pull out props and state from React objects as well. Um, you can actually do externally from outside of React. Uh, we've implemented functionality to do that. And we're hopeful we can add more functionality in for like Angular and stuff in the future. You can essentially log whatever you want. Any DOM event that takes place, whether it be a click or a mouse over or typing a key on the keyboard, or even the browser specific events such as resizing the viewport or losing focus of the viewport, all of these things can be quite easily tracked. Um, and we've got extensive documentation on the source code online that shows you exactly what you need to do to configure um, log UI to uh, work with all of that. Oh, I've got a, a few minutes left. Um, people have been quite complimentary about it so far. Um, so this is kind of like the war story slide, if you like. Um, we've managed to successfully get it to work with uh, five different research projects of which three unique experimental systems were used. Um, and they've all been successful ultimately. There have been a little couple of hiccups along the way, but we managed to get it to work and we managed to get some clean interaction data out of um, all of the studies that we've run. One of them indeed has been published. Um, it here was a paper with one of Claudio's PhD students, Nirmal, where he presented a a uh, SERP interface and he was playing around with widget positioning. Um, and we use log UI to capture the interactions with that, with that and that worked, that worked really well. Um, general comments we've had from people are that the documentation aids for a fast setup. Um, also with the idea of containerizing log UI. It's my first foray into playing around with Doc and Anger and seeing how everything works. So we've managed to get the system to uh, spin up with relatively little effort, I would say. So people can spin up their own instance of Log UI, and then by following the documentation, they're then able to get uh, a connection between their, their application and the Log UI server and then recording data without any help from me at all. So that was good. Um, that was a huge plus. One thing that was really um, nice to hear from people was, for those who have run user studies in the past before, um, they were comparing the experiences that they had in the past with their own previous uh, logging infrastructure compared to what Log UI spat out. And one of the people said there was less fluff, um, they called it, as they call it, um, compared to previous solutions, which meant that their analysis scripts were much, much more straightforward to write. And they were getting results out in like 15, 20 minutes. Um, there's, they said like, there's no need for me to put in all of these really strange edge cases or really strange conditionals like oh if the hover event if the hover right event happens before the hover in event then you need to do this or whatever um there was none of that which suggested that the idea of less is more and using the contemporary websocket technologies was actually um working pretty well so we were pleased with that 
But the difficult part was, um, or the, the downside that people kept reporting um, was uh, getting it to actually work properly with their respective systems. So as an example, we needed to get it to work with uh, SearchX, which is the in-house search experimental system that Claudia's lab has developed for the past couple of years. It's a very large and complex React application. And um, we need the logging functionality in Flog UI to start at a particular point and stop at a particular point because everything's loaded within a single page. And we needed to figure out where in the code base to add a line of code to say, start logging. That's not great. That means you have to sort of dig deep into your code and, and uh, uh, try and ascertain where to add these particular lines of code and instructions for Log UI to work and to function. Um, it would be really nice if there was a better solution to that problem, but I haven't come across one yet. Um, reducing the need for people to dig into their code base is one of the sort of the, the angles we want to try and sort of meet, and we haven't quite got there yet. So that's one sort of disadvantage. Uh, there's a number of like, uh, I know I'm running out of time, there's a number of discussion points as well um, that we can uh, that we have thought about. Uh, there's more in the paper as well. I invite you to have a look at that. Uh, but the sort of um, potential goal or goals that we're trying to sort of reach with this is potentially offer something like logging as a service platform with the ability for people to sort of perform their own analytics and analyze their data within some kind of interface that we provide. Uh, but a couple of points just to mention them very briefly is better testing infrastructure would be good. Um, because we know from looking at the logs when we were sort of testing it ad hoc as we were developing it, events can take place at different times from different browsers. So if you, if you had a um, Selenium driving, for example, which is a testing framework driving um, Firefox and then driving Google Chrome, you would often find that events would actually appear in slightly different orders or at slightly different times. And that might not, might not be mission critical for everybody, but it's something that we should be aware of and something that we should try and address if at all possible. Device support is another issue as well. Should we provide more support for mobile devices? Should we provide support for like, you know, um, gestures like pinching or zooming or whatever? Um, can we think outside the browser? Can we go full circle and think about other kinds of applications? Um, and what about systems that don't use traditional you know, mouse or trackpad and keyboard. What about conversational assistants? Can Log UI potentially be adapted and developed to work with uh, a conversation search assistant? Um, we wanted to try think about like big picture and think of like Log UI as a sort of like go-to sort of logging service for experimental research. But the biggest thing that we're sort of keen to sort of play around with is developing some sort of analytics dashboard because at present, you just simply download the log and then, okay, off you go. But what would, what would be cool if we could provide some way to sort of examine, to filter and compare logs that are actually on the system? Can we compute measures, you know, like typical IR measures on the fly? Um, can we develop an interface that works for any kind of search interface or experimental interface that the user or the experimenter has set up? These are all open questions that we're sort of still in the early, early stages of thinking about, and we would like to spend more time uh, investigating, but we're pretty sure that we would need to sort of update our sort of service side stack to, to deal with all of that, especially when it comes to large volumes of data, as reviewer two pointed out. And yeah, there's a couple of other things as well, you know, like recording the viewport, which is now possible with uh, contemporary web APIs. Um, having this information or having a video stream of what a user was doing in conjunction with the explicit captured interactions would help researchers improve their sort of like situational awareness of what was going on at a particular time. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, reducing the barriers for integration to get the system working in the first place, especially if your experimental apparatus is complex and has a lot of different avenues and uh, things that can go wrong. Uh, we've had bachelor students play around with it. This is uh, one of our uh, students who sort of made up some like box plots um, to try and demonstrate a potential interface design, although it's not very intuitive and it didn't work 
that well because all of the data was downloaded to the client so it's the browser which was horrendous um and we would need to think of better ways to do that but as a starting point it was a proof of concept that demonstrates that you know you can select different uh, filters and event types um and display them on a box plot to see how long the different durations would last and i'll run out of time here so I just want to say thank you very much indeed for your attention. Um, if you're interested in trying it out, it's uh, on GitHub. Source code's all there. Documentation is all there in a wiki. We're hoping to set up a, a website soon, and we're sort of scouting for money from the NWO and whatever to see if we can keep working on this uh, uh, some more. Uh, but it's a project that I've been really sort of excited to be a part of. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Try to speak up because at home they don't hear you very well. Yeah, I can't hear people very well. Uh, I actually just wanted to mention there was a question from David. David, if you want to take the lead, I don't know, turn off your microphone. David. Speak up. David asks if you, uh, you wanted to. Is that Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so thank you for this presentation. It was really interesting. Um, I, I did have one question. I, I've, uh, you know, I work for a particular company, and one of the things that pops to my mind around uh, capturing information from someone's interactions is security. Yeah. Um, so, for example, you you had a slide that showed sending this session ID. Um, something that like, if that's the actual session ID, some nefarious person getting could hijack the person's session. So what are some of the like security controls you have in place to make sure that people can't use this maliciously if it's intercepted? Sure. Uh, well, the session ID is uh, an automatically generated uh, UUID um, that LogUI generates when it encounters a new user. So it's unique to LogUI. Um, so that might not be perfect, but we have a series of rudimentary authentication measures in place at the moment to try and sort of stop malicious actors from potentially hijacking um, a user or hijacking uh, the recording of data for a particular sort of uh, application or flight, right? So if, for example, you had somehow managed to look at the source code for uh, a web application that used LogUI. You could pull out the application ID, you could paste it into your own web page, connect to the server, and then start messing around and recording information that was going to mess up that person's experiment. So we have, for example, at the moment, a really basic uh, and rudimentary um, mechanism, which checks the host name from where the web application's been hosted. And if it doesn't match what is expected, then it just simply bars the connection. Um, that's one aspect that we're looking at. We also have uh, authentication tokens in place as well. So for example, this is an optional feature. Uh, we'll probably have to make it compulsory in the future, but there is also a sort of like an authentication loop where you have to go through. You basically have like your username and your password. It gives you a token or the web interface gives you a token and you can spit that in as well. Um, so it's an area which we, or security and data privacy is something that we're really just starting to look at, but we have sort of played around with a few rough ideas, um, uh, I would say. Um, we had a comment from one of our viewers discussing the idea of potentially using uh, data pods. I hadn't really heard of them or used them before um, as a means of trying to protect your data. And, you know, maybe you could, potentially say which information you want to be sending off and so on and so forth as well. But I think that's a little bit farther down the line. But we have thought of a few rough ideas uh, and implemented them for now. Um, uh, still a long way to go. Thank you. Security is a big issue. So that's yeah. it's changing. So. For sure. <laughs> Thank you. Can you? I guess you can hear me. No, speak up. Speak up. Okay. So, um, yeah, I'll speak a bit louder again. So, my question is, or or notes to you, 
Uh, from my previous experience, what I noticed when collecting interaction data is there's an issue of figuring out when a session ends, for example. Yeah. Are you logging this in some way? Because I, I, I know you're collecting the session ID, but do you log also when a session, for example, ends? So when the user closes the browser or changes the browser or something? We try, yeah, so we try, that's a good question, man. Uh, we try to do that. Um, I think it works 90% of the time. We still need to come up with a better way of doing it. Um, so in this little screenshot here of the control app, I know it's a bit small, I apologize, but these, these little sort of green circles here, uh, these indicate that the session has been completed. So what we do is there's two ways that we can identify when a session ends. The first one is that the log UI client API has been programmatically told to stop. And when you stop it, it programmatically, it fires another special event off to the server to say session ended, boom, done. And then that's a sort of clear cutoff point, which says this experiment has been finished or whatever. The alternative, of course, is when the browser leaves the page or they refresh it or whatever. And we have, there is a, an event which is fired internally within the browser when uh, this page unload, I think it's, I think it's page unload. When this event is fired, you can then instruct your own library to then go and do something. So when a page unload event is fired, it then goes off, sends the special session ended thing uh, message to the server and then disconnects. Um, so you have a reasonably reliable way of determining when that happens. And of course, the person may come back to the page later on within the same uh, browser window. So the session then continues. So then we're able to see what the latest sort of session endpoint is. And then we can say what the start point, what the endpoint is with a relative degree of certainty. There are some circumstances, of course, where you can't really tell when the session ends. Like, for example, if there's a network connection issue or you know your connection drops out. Um, we haven't come up with a, a really good solution to try and sort of address that. And I don't think there really is an ideal solution there, is there? Um, but that is something we have had a look at for sure. Uh, and we've had reasonable success at trying to address. But I think that's only thanks to modern web APIs where you have that functionality now available at your disposal to say, oh, by the way, the page is being unloaded now. You might want to shut everything down and do what you have to do. Um, cause even though the Google Chrome window has disappeared from your screen, there's probably still something going on in the background before the process actually terminates. Uh, thanks, Davix. Uh, I see a lot of people, uh, uh, 